it does. Oh, you didn't get that? You didn't get that before? No. No, oh. I didn't either. Um, <clears throat> well, um, I don't know if I want to repeat all that. Let me no. just say that, let me just say to just uh, summarize that um, uh, my contention is that new objectivity isn't limited to Germany 1920 to 1940, that it, it, it um, got attention and followers in other countries and my interest here is to broaden, broaden the idea of what new objectivity is. So that's long story. That's the gist of it. Do you have a question on what I, what I said? I have a question, Simon. <clears throat> I'm actually wondering where the, if you know where the terminology new objectivity came from. Do you know the origin of that and? I read about it, and I can't remember what I read. Uh, so there is there is an actual point where they identify this, but I just don't remember now. And okay. I don't, I don't want to make up, but it yeah. has an origin. Okay. Like impressionism has an origin. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Thanks. Uh, you have to unmute. You mentioned idealism. Yeah. Can, can you expand that notion a little bit? Because in some ways, the objectivity you know, can overlap with that to some degree. Yeah, the, there is a lot of overlap here. So, you, so you're just going to have to go with the thrust of the whole thing. But idealism would be... Um, um, a belief in something that you can't see, a belief in the way the world turns will turn in a way that you think it will turn. Whereas new objectivity is um, life in its um, street level, um, fact-oriented direction. It's very... Um, um, these are the facts. This is this is the way it is. That's that's my my take on it. You can you could is a way to think about that something you could actually physically touch and put your finger on versus something that you have to yes yes imagine or yes. But now there's something that I remember um, writing out. Uh, which I can't find, but maybe I'll remember it. But it was how um, this was almost about an art that was not about art. In other words, it, it eschewed art to find an art in a kind of austere, everyday direction. Would you would you say that Alice Neal would be in that school if she were back then? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Clearly. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. And I I actually was thinking of something before, and I forgot to say it. But I would think I'm not sure of this, but I would think that there is a literary and poetic side to new objectivity, but I don't know enough to say. Who would they be? Um, but I, I, it would be my hunch that there are a counterpart. Am I correct? Well, I mean, I guess there was a focus on um, the thing itself. You know, don't make ideas. No, no ideas, but in objects, right? So that's sort of the start of modernism, um, and to take away adornment and high flown language and all that kind of stuff. So I think that's a bit of a correlate. Who would be uh, a poet that would connect with that? Well, like I guess Ezra Pound and the Imagists, uh, HD, I don't know, Carla's a poet too, if you he wants to chime I'm gonna in. Say, I, I was gonna say William Carlos Williams, but yeah. even um, some Rilke, I think. What about Gertrude Stein? 
Yeah. Um, uh, also, she's, it, it's she's just she's up. No, less go. logical, I think. She's she's. I I just don't think her work um, ends up being. Um, I guess um, as receivable as it seems like uh, this new objectivity or new what are we calling it new objectivity yeah I I think that um, Stein's work is a little more in the um, it just in another realm you know um, theologic. Um, I, I just want yeah. to add. So, I just want to add something. You're you reminded me of something. So yeah. what I want to add is that um, this isn't an all or nothing idea. So mm -hmm. the idea mm -hmm. here is that maybe a certain theme in an artist's work relates to new objectivity, and another theme goes a different direction. So in other words, it could be part of a bigger idea. So it would be easy for you to say, uh, I can see in Simon's work, a thread that heads to new objectivity, but other directions in his work go differently. Mm -hmm. And as far as I can see, that still would include me in this uh, group. So, it, for instance, one of the artists that we're going to look at today is Andrew Wyeth. So I picked out work of Andrew Wyeth that relates to new objectivity. But in Andrew Wyeth's work, it goes all over the place. In other words, if you looked at other things, other directions, you would say, oh, no, this is not what, what this class is about. But there is a definite theme in his work that connects with this idea. So I'd have to explain it that way, that, you know, that's very important. Um, so, um, you know, I just saw um, Curtis, if, he, if he's still around, it, getting on, and um, he should come back if he, if he wants to. But in, in any case, I want to just continue. Uh, so I'll take one more question, and then I'd like to go forward. Any anyone else? Okay, I I think I think this. Oh, Curtis, are you here? Oh, Curtis, I I just wanted to say hello to you. It's nice to see you, and um, uh, um, I hope you're okay, and um, I hope you enjoy the class. So. Uh, thanks for coming. Okay. All right. So I want to now uh, share the screen with the pictures. So let me try to do that. Okay, so the, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, yes. so the first <clears throat> artist uh, uh, leading off here is Otto Dix. So Otto Dix, his dates are 1891 to 1969. <laughs> 1969 seems very recent to me, but that's his dates. Uh, 1891 to 1969. He is in my opinion, the quintessential artist of new objectivity. Um, his work is um, bold, um, frank, sardonic, and um, it's almost like he mixed the paint with acid. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, very, very uh, alive. Um, I would say it's uh, a blazing naturalism. Um, his work is very modern. 
and very figurative. I would say his, his innermost expression would be whatever it takes, whatever it takes to get this across. He does a very dramatic series of self-portraits. He is a singular artist beyond classification. And actually, that is one of the trademarks, it seems to me, of new objectivity, is that the artists in new objectivity are kind of unclassifiable, even though you could say they're new objectivity. There's something about them that is very individualistic, very singular. You should try to find other work of his besides the, the uh, images that I show, and especially try to find prints. He's a fantastic printmaker, drawer, and um, painter. <clears throat> ah, so Otto Dix is my quote from him relates to what I was trying to say before. Otto Dix, all artists wanted to see things quite naked, clearly, almost without art. It's kind of like um, uh, less art, but more art. <laughs> it's kind of a crazy idea. Less uh, pumping the art up, but the effect is an art that is electrical. So this painting here in front of us could almost be um, yeah. a symbol of 1920 to 1940 Weimar. Um, I think that there is a, a story that um, Otto Dix was sitting in a cafe and he saw a woman, I'm going to imagine it is this woman, and he ran up to her and he said to her, I must paint you. You represent the error. Um, and um, this is uh, such a striking painting. Um, this painting is of Otto Dix's parents, and I think he does a few of these uh, of his parents. Um, again, this is Otto Dix, um, a kind of ferocious realism. but very closely observed. This woman could almost be a representative of the era as well. That looks like a different painter. Yes, yes, yeah. Um, uh, so Otto Dix is very influenced by uh, the First World War. And um, he does a number of prints and print cycles having to do with war. I believe he was a medic during the war. And no, he actually fought, Simon. He fought in the war? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. He volunteered and fought. Okay. So so I I assume that this is a painting of which is influenced by seeing people playing cards. But the people playing cards have disastrous injuries to them. And um, 
This is his attempt to record this. I think that these are actual playing cards, actual playing cards. So they collaged into the painting. Oh. And that gets to whatever it takes to do the painting, mm -hmm. whatever it takes. Um, this this painting is just amazing. I mean, really, it's mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. it, it it's like truly disturbing. Um, does quite a few um, self portraits, and um, is as intense personally as the paintings are. Um, this one coming up, uh, there's an interesting quality about this. Um, Otto Dix, this, is, this may seem utterly crazy, but Otto Dix thought that um, he was a, um, besides being a painter, he was a, um, a very good dancer like a ballroom dancer and he thought that if his first choice of an occupation didn't work out that he could be a ballroom dancer and um so i can you can just imagine him thinking about this uh in this painting and it's you know if you think of it this way there's something very funny about about this but it's not funny at all um because you know, imagine him thinking that, you know, people would come to him to take lessons in ballroom dancing. And this mm -hmm. this painting would be an advertisement for uh, his class in ballroom dancing. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, now this painting is owned by the Museum of Modern Art. And um, so, so in this painting, you have a capsulization of his whole point of view. So it's very shape-oriented, very austere, close, hard-looking, slow-looking, and really where naturalism becomes really crazily electrified and alive. So this is a laryngologist. It's on display now at the Museum of Modern Art. Oh, huh, oh, 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 it's terrific. Um, this one, um, it, this is so striking, uh, they have so much personality in them, uh, and he's not, um, he's not keen on good taste, he's keen on something else, and the something else would be hard to put into words, but it's definitely not good taste. Um, now this one um this one i must say i had a very interesting thing happen to me <clears throat> at the neue gallery one one time when i visited and that's a great museum uh really a real gift to new york city <clears throat> uh, one time when i went to visit this museum i saw a man who looked just like this man mm. looking at this painting and then he turned in my direction and he looked just like this man. He looked like this man had walked out of the painting. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Did you say something to him? No, no, there was nothing to say. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, he probably thought he looked like Cary Grant. Um, <laughs> it, there was nothing to say. It, it was just an amazing thing to see. Um, can I just say there's lots, my... there's lots that you could say about this painting, but I I I I want to just keep going. Um, I think Otto Dix does one or two triptychs, and this is one which might be on the theme of cabaret. Um, 
It's a very large painting. He's a very intense artist. And um, it takes, it maybe takes a while to get into him. But um, once you do, I mean, he is, um, he's like one of those pit bull dogs that doesn't let go. He's, he's mm -hmm. very intense. Mm -hmm. So um, the second, <clears throat> the second artist I chose, again, with the idea of framing new objectivity as more of a worldwide um, phenomenon is Andrew Wyeth. So this is the first one. Um, so Andrew Wyeth, 1917 to 2009. Um, so although Andrew Wyeth is very popular in the American mind, there is clearly a dark side to his vision. And I'm not sure how many people know about that side, but it's definitely there. It would be almost as if you were looking at the dark side of our town, the play, or if you were looking at the dark side or the antipode of Norman Rockwell. Hmm. Extremely fine draftsman beautiful tones, very close tones, amazingly close. So for instance, if you look at her cheek, the tones are very, very close together and they glow, but they're in shadow. Those are half tones, St very strong compositions very strong use of the rectangle and space. Very big believer in slow looking, great concentration, great sense of the everyday. And I would, I would say that in many of his pictures or most of his pictures, his skill set is subordinate to his expressiveness. So in other words, the first thing that I see is a mood and a, a poetry and expression, expression uh, rather than the rendering. So here are some uh, images of Andrew Wyeth. Now, again, I have shaped this so that I am giving you a certain direction in his work. Okay, another person, another, uh, another introducer of art or art connoisseur or whatever you want to call it could pick up other images of his work. I'm picking these up. Other images might be um, abstraction, or it might be um, the countryside, or it might be animals, or it could be windows, but I'm picking this up. And I think my theory is that this relates a great deal to the German artists that we're going to see. His compositions always have a very interesting element, an element of juxtaposition. So the woman is very small and the scale of the rectangle is big. She occupies relatively small part of the space. Then sometimes in, um, uh, amongst the figure, the figurative figure paintings, you'll see a still life, which seems to have the same kind of point of view. 
the same kind of slow looking composition and everyday quality. It, these are egg tempera paintings. They take a lot of time and they're based on mixing an egg with pigment powder. And they're done on wood panels, not canvas. So this is a very well-known painting, which is up at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, it almost seems um, like a visitor to the Museum of Modern Art, but um, it, it, it stands on its own. It's a very striking painting. Um, and um, I think it fits right into new objectivity. Simon, can I ask a question or maybe it's a... Yes, go ahead. Your opinion. Um, the, the thing you said about his skill set is subordinate to his expressiveness. Yeah. I I think that's really interesting and in that seeing the mood first rather than the skill or the rendering first. Yeah. Um, and how often, in your opinion, how often do you think that that's the case? With his see, work? The, with anyone's work. In general. You see the um, mood first and then the... Well, I... Skill. I, I think it's a fantastic question. <clears throat> um, the, the idea of rendering is a means to an end. That's my opinion. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so what is the end? It, it, okay. The end we could call X. Okay. So the, the artist is trying for X, but he's trying for it through some skill that the artist has. And um, if what you see is only skill, then that's unfortunate because it should head to something else. And that's my opinion. So another, and I think a lot of times we can be seduced by skill and slickness, okay, by the illusion of that. And that would be especially true in trompe l'oeil painting, but I think it's true in a lot of paintings. So, um, what, well, what would be the defining uh, question would be, um, does it stay on the surface? Does it take you below? Does it does it seem like an illusion? Does it make you think? Does it um, uh, give you a quick fix or reverberate? Okay, um, like a meal. Um, you enjoy the meal for a minute and then you forget about it, okay? But I, it's hard to say more because it'll be different for different people. But it really, I think it's really the crux of the issue. And yeah, that's, it's such, that's why such an interesting it. idea. Like yeah. what draws you in? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Let, let me, it, oh, thank go, you. Oh, okay. Let me continue. Um, Um, this is a painting that Wyeth did of, um, I think, a neighbor named Carl Kerner. Um, and um, one of the students, Ron, saw this painting, I think, last summer. Am I correct? Oh, he saw this painting in Albuquerque. It was a great and, shot. And you, you wrote to me about it. It's gorgeous. Yeah, I just, so, I just, I painted another visit a few weeks ago. Oh, oh. 
Well, look at the composition here. This is pretty amazing. So, but again, to me, it's um, it it has a mood that goes past the rendering. It has an insight that is more than the surface. Now, you know, uh, there are many ways to look at art. So I'm not saying that what I'm, what I told Kristen is, you know, like the voice of God. I, I don't mean it like that. It's just, that's the way I see it. And, um, of course, I believe I'm right, but but uh, but that's the way I see it. And the, but you could see art a lot of different ways. Okay, so here's another one by Wyeth. And then a few more. Again, beautiful compositions. Um, the idea of juxtaposition, the way I spoke of it before, with the lower and upper, close, far back, uh, lit up, murky, dark. Um, this is really sensational. And I thought to end with this, and to me, this is looks like it's right out of new objectivity. Um, let's do a third one and then stop and ask you ask questions or whatever. So the third one is George Gross. So it's Gross, G-R-O-S-Z. And his, actually his first name is Georg, G-E-O-R-G. -E 1893 to 1959. So the first thing about him is that he is an amazing draftsman. In all the pictures that we're going to see, you should look at the line and look at the expressiveness of the way the line works. Uh, he has an amazing imagination. And his depiction of Weimar is um, stirring. He would be clearly an artist where drawing supports painting. His work is full of tension and drive. The last painting of George Gross is um, a painting called Metropolis, which when I saw it, I realized that I'd never seen this painting in person and it's an amazing painting. So we'll get to that very soon. So these are paintings of George Gross. An interesting combination of collage, cubism, figurative art. The, the figures, the heads on the right-hand side are just amazing. Wow. So again, there are many different directions in art. And um, I strongly relate to this. But there are many different ways to look at art and um, many ideas and, um, and then many things that will happen in your life that will change. Uh, you'll find artists that you like a lot, then 15, 20 years later, not, not so much. And um, these, these artists are full of um, a certain kind of electricity that I find very appealing.
I mean, there's also an element of, of social satire, right? So how does that fit in with being objective? That's I mean, a, I guess just that's seeing a very what good, That's a very good question. Yeah, that's true. And I don't know the answer. <laughs> but it's a it's a it's a social satire maybe obliquely every day, but yet pretty weird. Um but yes, it you're absolutely correct. And I don't know how it fits in, but I've noticed in the in some reading that I did, it's definitely there. The Andrew Wyeth paintings are not satirical. This one has a surrealist feel. Yes, and there is an overlap between new objectivity and surrealism. Uh, we did this already. The sense of space in this is very unusual. Uh, everything is tipping forward. Almost falling out of the painting. Uh, this painting is a little straighter um, and um, it, it seems to me that this painting also could be a painting that describes this era. In, in its naturalism, it has a lot of force. I thought to show a few of his drawings. Um, <clears throat> uh, incredible line, incredibly expressive. Um, really an amazing draftsman. And these the drawings that are, that are like this one, I, I really am struck by. All line. And all really with great punch and great um, incision. No shading, all line. Weird as anything. Isn't this something? This is the painting that I was speaking about before called Metropolis. And it's actually, I, I learned just recently in the last few days that it's in a museum that I had visited a number of times in Madrid. <clears throat> For some reason or other, I missed this painting. Um, it's in the Tyson Museum in Madrid which is quite a nice museum. And um, I don't know why I didn't see this. So it means I will have to go back. <laughs> um, okay, so regarding the first three artists, is there a question or a thought that you might have? So please feel free, yeah, uh, Christina. Well, I guess I I don't want to push back against the idea of naturalism, but I don't see anything natural, right? It's sort of, it's anti, just because it's not romanticized and not idealistic, it has an attitude. You could say the Wyeth is like, what's the meaning of life? Sort of depressive, right? You could say there's like some debauchery or there's some, you know, there's an extreme, there are points of view. So I don't understand how, how you're using the term naturalism for what are clearly opinionated pieces, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, so naturalism would be, um, 
Um, <clears throat> very fact-oriented, very oriented towards details that you see, the accumulation of information as opposed to something that is theoretical. Like uh, in a certain direction in Renaissance art, there's a theoretical idea of the way form turns, the way you get volume, the way the form turns around, the way you can teach volume. And naturalism goes in a different direction. It's not theoretical. It's based on what's before you. It, but there's more to it, but I wasn't expecting your question, but that's right off the top. Um, it, um, Well, how would this painting, for instance, fall into that? This one? Category, yeah. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but it's cr pretty crazy. So, yeah. uh, and it's... Um, <laughs> so naturalism is crazy? <laughs> no, 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 no. That's another side of this. Um, as I said, the the categories are not, you know, rigid. Um yeah, but but um could you call it hyper realism is that accurate um maybe that's not a category <laughs> no i think i think um i think hyper realism would get back to Kristen's question. And in hyperrealism, the idea would be the illusion. In other words, the illusion takes you in. It looks like a photograph or it looks like something that's real, real. Um, a certain direction in naturalism <laughs> takes you under the surface by describing lots and lots of details. Um, I think of um, hyperrealism as being somebody like Robert Estes. Is that his yes. name? Yes. yes. Richard. 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 Estes. Richard Estes. Richard. Yeah. Richard. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, I keep wanting to think of literary examples wow. uh, because I'm nudge, I'm a nudgy, nudging you. But what about someone like Anne Dillard? Would she be a naturalist? Well, I guess I see these as so stylized, right? So when I hear natural, I think a natural feel. And I don't think, I, like I hear when you say details and whatever, I think realism, right? So it's more of how mannered is it? Like Otto Dix is quite mannered, right? So I don't know. There's a flair, Nabokov, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, a true depiction, but there is a flair and a attitude and you know a stance, right? Well, I think if you read Bulgakov, you wouldn't say that he was a naturalist. I I don't I think it's fantasy and uh, magic realism and um, you know just uh... Simon, I'm I'm coming to this. Uh just several days after having gone to the opening of the Big Bonard show here at the Phillips Gallery in Washington. And when you think about objectivity versus impressionism, you know, you, you've got to look at the Bonard a long time, in a sense, a longer time, contemplate it before, you begin, before the objects begin to develop like on a piece of photographic paper. Your, your mind has to absorb a lot of information before it starts to recognize form and, and, and relationship. These artists aren't asking our mind to associate. They're throwing it right directly at us. Yes, yes. I think that, that that's a major kind yes. of difference. It's the, it's the thingishness, the Sachlichkeit that, that is, is right 
that's yes. imposed on us. Yes. It doesn't ask us to to look for it. I agree totally. Is that the exhibit that was in? Um, yes, in, in Dallas. In um, at the um, Kimball in, in Fort Worth. Yeah, uh, the I guess Fort Worth. museum. Oh, it looked like a great show. It, it, I'm sure it was a great show. It's a beautiful show. Yeah, I I think I'm gonna come and visit you. Um, come down. You're all you're all welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so let me continue. Let me continue. Sorry. The, the next Sorry. artist that I have is um, Felice Caserate. So Felice, F-E-L-I-C-E, Caserate, C-A-S-O-R-A-T-I, 1883 to 1963, Italian. Um, so in new objectivity, there is... Uh, interesting use of form and the form can be influenced by abstraction. His, Caserati's compositions are very mysterious and he has a wonderful grouping of nudes, some of which I'll show. His art is form oriented, but incredibly expressive expressionistic, very simplified shapes and forms, influenced by Italian painters such as Piero de la Francesca. <clears throat> A critic, um, Raffaello Gioli, said about him, the volumes have no weight in them, and the colors no body. Everything is fictitious. Even the living lack all nervous vitality. The sun seems to be the moon. Nothing is fixed or definite, and argued that these very qualities give his work its originality. Uh, could you move down to, uh, you're not on the right painting. You're on the one, the oh, one yeah. that we're looking sorry, at. Sorry, sorry. <clears throat> so you could see the connection with Piero here. And mm -hmm. the formalism is also connected with new objectivity. So it's naturalism and a certain kind of formalism, which really doesn't make sense because yeah, so I could add to Christina, to your question, this is not naturalistic, this painting. This is very formalistic. This is very shape-oriented. Uh, so it's it's kind of mixed up. It's not I'm, it's not quite logical, but this is what I would say is the Italian version of this world. So this is another painting by Caserata. The very interesting quality of looking down at these objects. <clears throat> this particular painting is imbued with Caserati's uh, direction, his style, his form orientation.
So if you think back to the Andrew Wyeth, it's much more naturalistic than this. This is quite a striking painting, given his um, resolve to paint everything in such an abstract way, because this has so much character, so much expression. In this next group, I put two together. And um, you could see how form oriented all of this is. Okay, so the next artist is um, Latte Lassustein, L O T T E. L A S S E R S T E I N. L A S S E R S T E I N. 1898 to 1993. German and Swedish. Um, tremendously strong draftsman. Her work is full of humanity and a certain severity of form dark, moody, and mysterious imagery. Very modern and austere, humanistic and contemporary. Strong, open forms. Big, engaging forms in open spaces. Very beautiful self-portraits. She was christened as a child. She grew up in an assimilated German-Jewish household. She flees Germany and ends up living in Sweden for most of her life. In the writing on her, she is very much known for writing on uh, or for depicting the new woman in all guises, especially in Weimar Germany. So let's see some of hers. Uh, this is a detail of a much bigger painting, and I think this is her uh, magnum opus, this painting. So the forms are very big and strong and open. Her work was not known for a while, and it's now getting a new look. This painting might be maybe 80 inches wide. In terms of women painting in Germany, growing up in Germany and painting, um, th this is quite rare. Um, another artist that would fit into new objectivity is um, Kulwitz, uh, and we'll be talking about her later, but there is an exhibit that's coming to the Museum of Modern Art that I, I think should be terrific.
So here are some more paintings of um, uh, Lottie Lasserstein. What I pr I would probably you'd probably pronounce her name Lasserstein, but we'll say Lasserstein. She's a very good painter and very serious. I mean, like incredibly serious. Is this a self-portrait? I yes, I think the one on the left. Yes. Yeah. And what's her medium? It almost has that temporal look. It's oil. Oil. It's oil, yeah. 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 Um she had I I I feel or I believe a very interesting life. One that would warrant a book or a, a reading, really interesting life. These are very striking paintings. Um, I I think I might have seen one or two in person, but if you can read the uh, detail off the JPEGs, they they just look great. Should definitely look up her work because um, there were so many to choose from. Uh, Simon, do you know if they're um, in New York at all to be seen? No, you know, the interesting thing is that um, a friend of mine, <clears throat> He first got me involved in her work maybe um, five or 10 years ago, eight years ago. And he had seen her work in London at, at a, um, I think an auction house or a fancy art gallery called, I think Agnews, A-G-N-E-W. And they were promoting her work. And my friend was very taken with this art and he had bought what he described as a very expensive book on her work. And he insisted that I come back to his house uh, to see it. And um, that's the first time I knew of her work. I really knew of her work. Um, it, I, I think it's very interesting to see an artist that you don't know of and just respond. And, uh, I think that's great. Here's some more. This is a drawing which looks like a self-portrait. And this one is a self-portrait, and this one is fairly well known. There's a resonance of Norman Rockwell. Uh, I, not not in a bad I, way. I don't. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It seems. It seems like. A, Norman oh. Rockwell with a headache, maybe. <laughs> it seems like, yeah, it seems like a little darker than Norman Rockwell. Yeah. 
uh, but yet yeah, some connection. Um, but I actually was thinking of something else. I was thinking of the connection with her and Colvitz. Um, so Colvitz, I know more about, but very few people know about Colvitz. And whenever I have a class and I use, I talk about her, I usually ask how many people have heard of her or respond to her, or et cetera, et cetera. And the answer is very few. And it seems to me that they're, these two artists are presenting a point of view, which um, is um, not upbeat, which is quite downbeat. And um, maybe that's the reason that they're not as well known as, as they should be. This person in particular, but Kovitz is, um, uh, you know, there's no um, um, groupies, Kovitz groupies around. Anyway, then, so the next artist and the last one is Stanley Spencer, which is this one. So Sp Stanley Spencer, 1891 to 1959, um, very singular artist, wonderfully intense paintings, charged with form and a kind of electrical energy, a spectacular series of nudes. What are his dates again? 1891 to 1959. Thank you. you you're welcome. Uh, he had quite an extraordinary private life. I'm not sure if we could get to this, but take my word for it. This is really extraordinary. Um, his life as an artist and his life in terms of his um, private life were depicted in a play called Stanley. Uh, it's a wonderful play. Um, big, austere, and intense forms. He has a great influence in English art, uh, especially in the direction of Lucian Freud, but in other directions as well. He does a series of depictions of the Bible. It, for me, these paintings are more interesting than the depictions of the Bible. Many of these paintings, the religious paintings, were done in a small town, um, I think north of London, called Cookham. C-O-O-K-H-A-M. And I've been told that to get a really big idea of his mentality and his life, it, it's important to go visit them. But I never had the chance to do that. It, it, uh, but I've been to London many times. Um, he, he is a kind of mystic or... Uh, naive. This is him, self-portrait, Stanley Spencer, quite a small painting, um, maybe 18 inches high. Who was that woman? I don't remember her name, but um, at the first class I took with you a couple of semesters ago, there was some either British or American painter who did really big portraits of people with very ruddy faces. This this is reminding me of her. I wish I could remember her name. Oh, you mean um, uh, yeah. I I know I know who you mean. She's quite a young woman. Yeah. She's not American. She's English. She's British, right? Yeah, British. Um, the name will come to me. But let let me continue. Okay, all right. All right, thanks. Uh, so this is um, uh, 
another portrait of Stanley Spencer. This woman, I believe, was his second wife. I think her name was Patricia Pierce or Peace. It's close to that. This is a very interesting painting. It almost seems like he's uh, conducting an orchestra. This is also a self-portrait? Yes, yes. Uh, so this is a photograph of him and his painting of the second wife. He was actually um, quite small. He was maybe like five foot four or five foot five or five foot three. And he would, he, I think he lived in Cookham and he would walk around with a, uh, a pram and in the pram were his painting uh, tools and easels and all kinds of things. And um, in the play, they had the actor who played him constantly walking around with all this junk with him. Um, a real eccentric. Very, very strong form in these paintings. So this this painting, this is fresh in my head. But this painting, I wouldn't call naturalistic. It, it's more abstract than naturalistic. But it's, if you think of the Kazerati paintings before, it's definitely not as far away, as far along as that. So there is a range here. This is self-portrait older. So this one, I think, is a painting of his first wife. Um, I, I think these nudes are just incredible, very um, palpable and um, um, sensual. Definitely, those are like Lucian Freud, right? <laughs> yes, I, 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 yes, I, absolutely, absolutely. Um, This is self-portrait, um, Stanley Spencer. You skipped one painting, a nude. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, thank you. Um, so um, this painting I have seen, it's stunning. And... Um, <clears throat> The picture plane is so close to these people. It's almost like if he took a step backward, he'd be in the space with you. Um, and he just hold on, hold on. The, um, his relationship with this woman is quite unusual. You should read about that. Um, and um, he's like a, a mystic or like a, a naive traveling around the world and being kind of overwhelmed. Um, this is not a big painting, but it's full of intensity. And I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like this so um, pulsing. 
this is this is quite well known, and this one is even more well known. This one. So this painting is not cropped. This is this is the painting. And the cropping actually uh, enhances the whole thing. And it is um, uh, incredibly frank, electric, and um, upending. Um, and carnal. Um, we don't have that much time, but if you have a question uh, or a statement or comment or anything, um, say what you what you have to say. Um, I have a comment. Yeah. I have a comment about Otto uh, Dix and Bros. I almost didn't do this class because I really hate looking at those paintings. <laughs> And this will maybe sound hyperbolic, but I get this feeling of perversity and sadism. I know that sounds strong, but can't think of any softer words to use for those two guys. Do you but, still feel that? Pardon? But isn't do that? Still, do you still feel that? You mean this minute? Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. But, but Simon, isn't that? to some extent, a function of, of the era that they were looking at and painting. I mean, yeah, they, between the between the wars. Yeah. War, yes, you know, they, uh, there, there was all this stuff about lust murders and, and sexual, yeah. I mean, it sounds like they were really painting what was going on. Um, well, you know, you're, you're very sharp about uh, Kathleen, you're very sharp on the fine arts, and I'm sure you've thought about this. So there's no way to argue it. I, I, I think they're full of feeling. So that's that's how I would. That's the first thing I would say. Then I could say many. Feeling. Yeah. Well, whatever. But uh, but it, it's feeling. Yeah. It's, if you're yeah. interested in if you're interested in feeling, that's feeling. Yeah. yeah. Um, any other questions? Um, I only see a few people here on my screen, so maybe I should, um, we're all here. Yeah. Maybe I should try to see if I could see more. Oh, I have a question. Yes. Hello? Yes. Yes. Uh, I'm looking at the last one, the Stanley Spencer, uh, the two people. I'm looking at the bottom of the woman underneath her. What am I seeing underneath her? It looks like flesh. It almost looks like a piece of a body or like part of a chicken or it's a see a your question is excellent. Uh, I, I've seen this painting. It's a I think it's a mutton chop. Oh, wow. Uh, it's like Amazing. a lamb shop, a mutton shop. And I think the the idea is the um uh, the flesh, the uh the tantalization of the flesh, the, okay. the seduction of the flesh. And and there's actually something quite funny about this because um Eileen, you you really like this this one. What's funny about it is that this woman, um, par partly li partly lived with Stanley and his wife, and then somehow inveigled herself into this relationship. Stanley became quite gaga about this woman, and I think he left his wife. Well, he, he didn't entirely leave her, but he left her maritally, and he married this woman. And you would you would look at this painting, and you would never guess at all that this marriage to this woman was That's never true. consummated. <laughs> you would never guess it. You would never guess that. 
Okay. It wasn't? Never. No. no. Well, I mean, it, you, if you, you look know? at the painting, you think <laughs> it's out, outrageous, outrageously sexual. Okay. But but it's his mind. It's in yeah. his mind. Right. You can, you can see where the fire is actually burning in the picture. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> can I also mention another where her her hip is, her butt, buttock, it doesn't seem to go in. Her thigh is kind of weird there too, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Well, she but, apparently was a lesbian and lived with her lover even after they were after he and she were married. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, I see it all now. <laughs> uh, Carla, do you have a thought or question? No. <laughs> uh, okay, so so I think I think this is uh, this is a nice point to stop. Uh, oh yes, go ahead. Just something. Just I was just interested in your take on an association I've had. As looking at various of these artists, I found myself thinking of Ivan Albright. Yes. Uh, yes. And I don't. Know, I have a hard time reconciling that with naturalistic because. Uh, you know, his figures are, you know, can be so gargoylish at, at, at times and exaggerated and character and um, char 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 characteriz characterizations, caricatures. That's what I'm looking for. Uh -huh. um, I can't I can't I can't really reconcile that. But but I kept getting that association with many of these images. With what? With many of these images evoked. Yes, Ivan Albright yes but I, I, I. I think you could argue that his work is very naturalistic. It's very, like, incredibly, incredibly fastidiously detailed. Indeed. Yeah, I mean, to the point where you feel like the skin is crawling. Indeed. <laughs> exactly. So, so um, um, is Frank Horton there? No? Yes. Um, Yes, you are. Come here. Do you have a question? Uh, well, I do. Now that I, I know your name. Now that I know your name. <laughs> um, well, I'm kind of interested in in a little bit of the relationship between the uncanny and new objectivism. Yes, I agree. Yeah, yeah. The uncanny about mm -hmm. the everyday. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that yeah. It, sense. It, when you look at something long enough, it starts to look stranger and stranger and that's i i should have said that that's very smart that's the underpinning for this yeah the slow kind of the slow looking and how the strangeness it's yeah. a it yeah. seems like it's an experience where the time looking the strangeness goes up and up and up and yes. you're yes yes you're absolutely there. and you should look up ivan albert if you don't know him yeah um well i think Sorry. this is a good point Bye, can what? I say one thing that has popped into my head? You asked about a literary equivalent, maybe. And I just read As I Lay Dying by Faulkner. And I'm wondering about that as a... Um, and on this note of this, the more you look, the stranger it gets. But it's about mm -hmm. everyday life of a family. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a thought that. Yeah, I, I, I wish I had, I knew that book, but I don't. Does anyone else know that book? No, but you know what I'm <laughs> thinking of? Uh, Hubert Selby, who wrote um, Last Exit to Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and also Charles Bukowski. I see this, a relationship between those two authors and what I'm seeing in these paintings. Uh, I think I can understand what you mean. Uh, thank, thank you. Um, well, I, I, I don't wanna go past 8.30. I think this has been great. And um, so, so we've done six of these and next week we'll do six more and then the week after six more. And, um, and the week after that, you will present. And I'll write to you and sort of explain 
the kind of essay or piece of writing that you should be thinking about. Um, and again, if some of you have trouble with the writing, you can just speak or present ad lib, or you don't have to even present, you can just listen. But it is actually very interesting to hear what other people come up with. So you'll need two images. And uh, I think in the next few days, I can send you all the images and you will be able to access them. So I'll describe that next week. Um, well, you've been very involved and uh, really um, scintillating and um, thank you very much. And um, uh, it's wonderful to put this together and uh, see you next week, okay? Thank you, bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay. bye. okay, nice meeting you, Frank. Nice meeting you. <laughs> Good night. Okay. Good night. Yeah. <laughs>